Greetings again. This will be a talk on pediatric pneumonia. We will do a quick overview. We'll talk about the common pathogens by age. The test seems to be really obsessed with this. Uh, and so even though we tend to treat pediatric pneumonia or really any pneumonia empirically, it's good to know uh, what some of these pathogens uh, are and what what tends to predominate uh, based on age. And there's a lot of differences uh, from one age to another in, uh, in children as far as pneumonia pathogens. So we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, we'll talk about how these children tend to show up, how you can differentiate uh, this based on those symptoms, how we go about diagnosing this, the best way to diagnose it, the most accurate way, and then how we manage this, keeping in mind that how we manage these children in the hospital is different than how we manage them outside the hospital. So as a brief overview, pneumonia still is the leading killer of children worldwide. That is, you know, usually we would think of something else, something maybe a little more exotic, like cholera or something like that. But no, pneumonia, that's the number one cause of uh, children's death worldwide. 29% of uh, pediatric deaths worldwide is pneumonia. Now that's not in the U.S., that's worldwide. Uh, there's 158 million cases per year. It also causes 3 million deaths per year. And I think that's for everybody, not just children. Uh, the death rate in underdeveloped countries, this is a big one, I never thought about this. The death rate in underdeveloped countries is 2,000 times higher uh, than that of children in the U.S. With, for pneumonia. So if you are a child in an underdeveloped country, you are 2,000 times more likely to develop or to die from pneumonia than if you're a child in the U.S. with pneumonia. So that's pretty staggering. Before school age, viruses predominate, particularly the RSV virus, uh, or respiratory syncytial virus, uh, and the parainfluenza virus. So RSV, again, popping up here as a uh, problematic virus for young children. It is the cause of the majority of cases of bronchiolitis. It can cause acute bronchitis, and indeed is one of the leading causes of pneumonia in small children. So the characteristic pathogens by age. We're not going to be talking about the newborn here because this is a totally different uh, subject because the causes are completely different. Uh, with newborns, uh, the number one cause are uh, group B strep, uh, also gram negatives, and listeria. Remember with listeria, it's the very, very, very young and the very, very, very old, uh, 65 years of age or older, where we're really considering listeria as a possibility. And that is important because the empiric antibiotics we give uh, in general, for the general population, does not cover listeria. So in very young patients and newborns and the very elderly, possibly already sick, uh, we consider listeria. But we're not talking about newborns here. I did a, I did a section on uh, newborn pulmonary diseases, so you can go back and refer to that. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, children, uh, roughly three weeks of age to 15 years of age, adulthood, uh, early adulthood. Uh, and so three weeks to three months of age, uh, the number one cause uh, are viruses, and that holds true for four months to four years of age as well. You can see, though, that as you transition, as you get older, um, the causes uh, start to pop up that you get in older ages, things like mycoplasma. So three weeks to three months of age, we're looking at viruses, RSV, parainfluenza virus. You can get uh, your pneumococcal pneumonia, strep pneumonia. Uh, Staph aureus is another possibility, however, this is usually acquired in the hospital. Uh, so if a child develops pneumonia in the hospital, then uh, we want to usually cover Staph aureus. Another reason we might cover Staph aureus is if there's cavitating lesions. Uh, Chlamydia trachomatis is a possibility. This is, uh, is going to be something that is uh, congenital. Uh, you get it from mom and you develop pneumonia symptoms uh, in infancy. Uh, but this is not something that children get from the environment. Bordetella pertussis is a possibility as well. We think of this with the staccato cough and the whoop. Uh, this is uh, a whooping cough. Four months to four years of age, again, viruses are overwhelmingly uh, the more common cause. Uh, and then we also think of possibly strep pneumonia. And then mycoplasma, less common than in older children and young adults, but it is a possibility. And then in school-age children, mycoplasma pneumonia starts to become a little bit more common, certainly the most common when we're talking about teenagers and young adults. Uh, strep pneumonia remains a possibility. Also, chlamydia pneumonia is, uh, is possible as well. This is not an STD. Chlamydia pneumonia is not the same as chlamydia trachomatis. You do not get chlamydia pneumonia from sex. You get chlamydia pneumonia from the environment. And chlamydia pneumonia looks very similar to mycoplasma pneumonia, whereas strep pneumonia is the classic bacteria, lower pneumonia. Okay, now there are other causes, uh, but uh, we're talking about 
otherwise healthy people here. If you're dealing with a patient with cystic fibrosis, there's a lot of other things that we need to consider, but we're not talking about that here. Okay, so this is mostly the community-acquired pneumonias we're talking about in this section. The history and presentation. Okay, so I already said this, but please note, in newborns and very young infants, the presentation is different. A lot of times, some of the symptoms that you expect to see in children and adults do not show up. They a lot of times are silent, and then all of a the sudden, they will just decompensate. And so it's very important to keep in mind that newborns and very young infants, uh, the situation looks a lot different. So see the other section for more information. Cough is the most common presenting symptom. A lot of times it'll be productive, especially from onset, and that sort of separates it from acute bronchitis in which the cough is usually unproductive at onset and becomes more productive with time. So cough is the most common presenting symptom. A lot of times it's accompanied by fever. Now the degree of that fever, literally the degree, is going to be important uh, when we're considering what is the cause of this pneumonia. So viral, like I said, more common cause in very young children. Overall, it tends to be the more common cause in children, but uh, low-grade fever, upper respiratory tract symptoms, so your common cold-like symptoms, perhaps a mild tachypnea, crackles, and wheezing. Whereas bacterial pneumonia, these children appear much more ill. High-grade fever, uh, chills, a more severe cough, it might be described as a hacking cough. They may have chest pain from all that hard coughing. A lot of times they have a more toxic appearance, they just look sicker. Tachypnea, uh, just like in viral pneumonia, but it might be worse. Uh, adventitious lung sounds can be heard. A local dullness to percussion. This is important to do. Percuss the lungs, have the child breathe in, and then percuss the lungs through the lung field. Uh, if you have a dullness, a dull area, uh, that could be the area where the pneumonia, the bacterial pneumonia, is particularly affecting. Viral pneumonia tends to be more generalized, and we'll see this on the x-ray, whereas bacterial pneumonia tends to sort of consolidate in one area, in one lobe and that's where your dullness to percussion will be. In severe cases of bacterial pneumonia, you can have respiratory distress, cyanosis, diminished breath sounds. That's gonna be an indication to intubate the child because usually with diminished breath sounds, we're talking about respiratory fatigue. Mycoplasma and chlamydia pneumonia uh, tend to be more gradual onset. They can have constitutional symptoms, muscle pains and aches, and this just sort of comes on very gradually. But usually they're not to the point where they're so sick that they can't go into work. And so this is often ca called, uh, or, or to school, I suppose, this is often called walking pneumonia. And it comes on and it lasts for quite a while. Uh, and the cough and hoarseness tend to get worse, uh, but they're not as sick looking as the viral, it's certainly the bacterial pneumonias. And when you get a chest x-ray on these patients, it looks really bad in a lot of cases, and we'll, we'll see this. And it, it just looks worse than how they present. And that's a very common uh, phrase that comes up in the USNO. Like the chest x-ray looks worse than how they present or presentation, and uh, or out of proportion to presentation. That's classic for mycoplasma pneumonia. So our differential here, uh, especially when we're dealing with younger children, acute bronchitis, uh, typically the fever is going to be absent to low grade, less severe presentation, even less severe than viral pneumonia. Chest x-ray might be unremarkable. With viral pneumonia, however, you'll typically have a, and you can expect to have some findings on chest x-ray, usually streaking. Bronchiolitis, these are children that are much younger, so you can pretty much rule out bronchiolitis if you have a child that's older than three. Uh, wheezing will predominate. If you get a chest x-ray, a lot of times you'll see hyperinflation, although you can see that with acute bronchitis too. So really age is the way we differentiate out bronchiolitis. If you get a swab of uh, like a nasopharyngeal swab, you'll isolate RSV in most cases, and then you can uh, you also can see a prolonged expiratory phase. Although that's that can be difficult to, especially if the child's tachypneic, that can be somewhat difficult to uh, to detect. Cystic fibrosis always a possibility if you have a child with repeated episodes of pneumonia. Now you probably heard me say in multiple sections that we get newborn screening tests, and that we do, and that helps us diagnose cystic fibrosis much earlier than we used to before we did newborn screening tests. However, it is important to remember that the newborn screening tests, when we're testing for cystic fibrosis on there, we only test for a limited amount of genes. Otherwise, it would be expensive. And we only detect 90% of cases of cystic fibrosis on the newborn screening test. So it certainly is possible for a child who had a newborn screening test to uh, have cystic fibrosis and show up with symptoms later. So what do we expect with cystic fibrosis in an older patient, maybe three, four, five years old? We would expect repeated episodes of lung issues. Uh, perhaps they didn't have any newborn screening, although even if they did and they tested negative for cystic fibrosis, we still have to consider it. 
maybe there's a family history of cystic fibrosis, although it is a autosomal recessive disease, and so it's possible to not have a family history as well. Failure to thrive would be a big one. Cystic fibrosis patients, particularly if they're untreated, and even if they are treated in a lot of cases, they tend to be really thin. Uh, but patients who do have cystic fibrosis and have pancreatic uh, issues or they're not uh, secreting pancreatic lipase, pancreatic amylase, um, then uh, they can have failure to thrive. And so look for that in the history as well. Okay, uh, so for workup, uh, we're going to do, of course, a respiratory evaluation. We do that with any child who's got wheezing, coughing, um, pretty much any child that comes into the hospital, we're going to get a respiratory rate and a saturation. Uh, if necessary, we can give them supplemental oxygen uh, and then put them on an apnea monitor if necessary, especially with the very, very young children. Uh, we want to get a CBC with differential. If they have a fever, you reflexively get a CBC because we're considering infection and we want to know are there elevated neutrophils, are there elevated lymphocytes, what's going on. Uh, blood culture or a nasopharyngeal swab, that's going to be based off of suspicion. So if they are very, very, very ill appearing, you want to get a blood culture uh, because we're thinking more bacterial pneumonia, something sepsis related. Uh, if we were thinking more of a viral pneumonia, you can get a nasopharyngeal swab. You could get both if you want, but uh, blood culture, you're more going to get if you're thinking bacterial process, nasopharyngeal swab if you're thinking uh, more of a viral process. And then a chest x-ray. Of course, if you, anytime you have respiratory symptoms in conjunction with a fever or respiratory symptoms in conjunction with desaturation or uh, requiring oxygen, uh, you want to get a chest x-ray. And I want to emphasize when you are practicing, do not just order an AP x-ray. Yes, in many cases, you can diagnose pneumonia with just an AP x-ray. And yes, you'll probably just be given an AP x-ray on the test if you're expected to point out pneumonia. But in practice, always get an AP and lateral view uh, of the lungs. On chest x-ray, we get some hints as to whether this is viral or bacterial. So viral tends to have, uh, it tends to look very similar to how bronchiolitis or uh, acute bronchitis looks. You get that hyperinflation, uh, and that's due to the fact that you have obstruction, ball valve mechanism, you'll get oxygen uh, retained in the lungs, uh, generalized infiltrates, peribronchial cuffing. Uh, also this sort of streaking pattern, which I'll show you in some pictures in a little bit. With pneumococcal, you tend to have a lobar consolidation, which looks totally different. You have consolidation in one area, the rest of the lungs look a lot better. Uh, Staph aureus can give you sort of these, I guess I wouldn't call it an abscess, more of a, uh, of a um, cavitating uh, lesions. Um, call it an abscess, I suppose, but uh, cavitating lesions in Staph aureus. You might not see that with Staph aureus pneumonia, but when you really should consider staph pneumonia is when the child has been hospitalized. Um, that's when we're going to usually empirically treat the child for uh, staph pneumonia. Mycoplasma pneumonia uh, tends to be an interstitial uh, pattern, usually in the uh, lower lobe, and it looks a lot worse than the patient presents. Uh, however, I do need to point out that mycoplasma pneumonia can look a lot of different ways on chest x-ray. This is the more common way that it will usually show up on x-ray, but there's no chest x-ray that's pathognomonic for mycoplasma or chlamydia pneumonia, which looks just like mycoplasma pneumonia. Uh, so no chest x-ray is pathognomonic for either of these pneumonias. The way you are going to treat these is just based on the patient's age. So if you have a 16-year-old that comes in with pneumonia-like symptoms, um, usually they're going to have that picture uh, that we discussed with more constitutional symptoms or protracted uh, hoarseness. You're going to just go ahead and treat them empirically for mycoplasma pneumonia. And those medications typically cover the other uh, bacterial possibilities. Um, so usually it's going to be age that helps us differentiate this out. But um, this is the more common presentation on x-ray uh, with mycoplasma. Uh, if you want to look up uh, the radiology of this, I encourage you to do so, but you don't have to. Uh, usually on the USMLE, when they give you a patient uh, with mycoplasma pneumonia, it's going to be quite obvious in the question. You should definitely think of this in older children, so school age, teenagers, young adults. The white count uh, with viral, as we would expect, is going to be a lot lower, uh, certainly less than 20. Uh, lymphocytes will predominate, as we would expect, with viral causes. Uh, whereas with bacteria, it's going to be a much higher white count uh, with uh, possibly left shift. Granulocytes are going to be higher, particularly neutrophils. 
Uh, definitive diagnosis is uh, going to be uh, with your viral, uh, we kind of alluded to this earlier, but for, uh, for viral uh, pneumonia, you will isolate the virus from respiratory swabbing, so get a nasopharyngeal swab. There are rapid tests that are available for RSV, parainfluenza, influenza, and adenovirus, except the most common viral culprits. For bacterial pneumonia, you'll get isolation from blood cultures, but there is a high false negative rate for strep pneumonia infections. Uh, it's very high, 70 to 90 percent. So just because there's a negative blood culture does not mean you don't have a bacterial pneumonia. If you get a chest x-ray with a low bar pattern and they have that sort of toxic high fever presentation, it's bacterial pneumonia. The reason we're getting a blood culture is we just want to nail down what this particular bacteria is if it's present. Um, and so that will guide our therapy. And the rare possibility that it might be something other than strep pneumonia. With mycoplasma, you can get IgM titers. So there's a specific test for that to nail that down definitively. Okay, so this is a table that can help you sort of differentiate viral from bacterial. We kind of already talked about this. Uh, bacterial pneumonia, much higher temperature, whereas viral pneumonia usually has low grade fever. Upper respiratory tract signs, your common cold symptoms, uh, you get with the viral pneumonia, not so much with bacterial pneumonia. Toxicity, appearance, much worse with bacterial pneumonia. They just look sicker. When you come into the room, you see the child, they look sick. Okay, they're not going to be the child running around the room playing with things. They're going to be the child sitting on mom's lap. Uh, with uh, your uh, physical exam, uh, rails will tend to be localized with bacterial pneumonia, where they're more scattered, generalized with uh, viral pneumonia. Also, I didn't put it on here, but you can have some dullness to percussion in a region of the lungs with bacterial pneumonia. You will not get that with viral pneumonia. Viral pneumonia is just more generalized throughout all of the lungs, whereas bacterial pneumonia tends to be more consolidated in one area. Your white count will be much higher with bacterial pneumonia. You can have a slightly elevated white count with viral pneumonia. It'll tend to be lymphocytes, though, and it could be normal as well. Uh, chest x-ray, you see low bar consolidation with bacterial pneumonia in most cases. You'll see a, with viral pneumonia more of a streaking pattern. And then the definitive diagnosis for viral pneumonia is nasopharyngeal washings, just a swab with bacterial uh, pneumonia. It's going to be blood cultures. But remember, remember the high false negative rate. So if you get a negative blood culture, it does not mean that you treated the child with antibiotics and they didn't have pneumonia. If they're in the hospital, it doesn't mean you stopped the antibiotics. Uh, just remember the false negative rate. Important to remember that for practice. Okay, so here's a chest x-ray. Uh, this is a bacterial pneumonia. So you notice uh, nice clean lung fields in the left here, and then on the right, uh, sort of pretty clear in the bottom, and on the top to a lesser degree, although we, uh, uh, if we look at this right middle lobe here, you see uh, lobar consolidation. This is certainly lower consolidation down here. I believe this is the right lower lobe, although it's kind of hard to tell without a lateral view. Um, so this is a lobar consolidation here. This is an adult patient, but it pretty much looks the same in a pediatric patient. Again here, you see another, uh, another consolidation. Okay, this is viral pneumonia. You see more streaking, more of a generalized pattern. And again here. And again. Okay, now this is uh, your mycoplasma pneumonia. You see here more of a lower lobe uh, infiltrative pattern. It doesn't look quite as consolidated as uh, the bacterial pneumonia, but it's very difficult to tell these apart. Uh, particularly, uh, I want to point out again that uh, not all mycoplasma pneumonia chest x-rays look the same. So there's no chest x-ray that's definitive for mycoplasma pneumonia. So really, uh, you never make a diagnosis based on radiography alone. Uh, you always take into consideration the, the, the clinical picture and your friendly radiologist is going to want you to give the clinical picture to them because it makes their job a lot easier. So anytime you order something from radiology, give them at least the very basics of, of the patient. They will appreciate you for that. Again, here you see a lower lobe pattern. Uh, so uh, hopefully I've uh, sort of ingrained that into you. Uh, bacterial pneumonia tends to be low bar. Viral pneumonia tends to be generalized. Mycoplasma pneumonia, lower lobe usually, but you cannot definitively diagnose it based on chest x-ray. Okay, so when do we hospitalize patients with pneumonia? Not always, uh, but there are some uh, factors, and they tend to be pretty uh, obvious, uh, pretty 
intuitive. So if they're very young, of course, we think of hospitalization just because they're more likely to have respiratory distress. They tend to do worse because of their small uh, airways. Uh, if they have had any respiratory distress, usually that's going to cause them to require, sorry about my typo there, uh, usually respiratory distress means they're gonna need supplemental oxygen, so these two kind of go together. Uh, if they're dehydrated, which usually means that they're vomiting or can't tolerate PO fluids, that's a problem, not just because they can't tolerate PO fluids, but because the medications that we give for outpatient management are also PO, and so if they can't tolerate PO fluids, we're going to assume that they can't tolerate PO meds either. Uh, those meds aren't going to stay down, so we need to treat them IV. If there's multiple low bar involvement, we want to treat them in the hospital. I didn't show you any pictures of that, but if you do have a patient with multiple low bar involvement, they are going to be in the hospital. Toxic appearance, you can kind of go either or on that, but if they're really toxic appearing, it's probably safer to keep them in the hospital. Certainly if they're immunocompromised, uh, if they have cystic fibrosis, and I just want to stop here and say, if this patient who comes in with pneumonia has a history, a documented history of cystic fibrosis, it is a totally different animal. We treat them totally different. So we are, we've been talking about otherwise healthy children with pneumonia. Cystic fibrosis uh, patients with acute respiratory symptoms, we treat totally differently. So I want you to just be aware of that. We'll talk about cystic fibrosis later on in this section. Also, if there's, uh, you do send them home and there's no response to PO antibiotic treatment, then treat them in the hospital. And then of course, if there's social or care issues um, that you don't think they're gonna get the care that they need at home. So with viral pneumonia, uh, we just do supportive care. Uh, you'll monitor, uh, have the parents monitor that, them at home and return if there's any deterioration. They certainly should not get worse. Uh, once you start, uh, once you've diagnosed them, they tend to get better. It's pretty self-limited when it's viral. Uh, but note also that 30% of children with viral pneumonia uh, will, develop some kind of coexisting bacterial infection as well. And so that may be a case where uh, then, well, that will be a case when uh, you're, you're gonna end up treating them with antibiotics. So child comes in with no improvement in symptoms, you're gonna get another chest x-ray to see if there's any bacterial involvement. In the case of bacterial pneumonia, if you don't need to hospitalize them, then you can just treat them with oral amoxicillin. Other things that you can give them uh, are Augmentin or amoxicillin clavulonate. Uh, you can also give them Ceftin, uh, which is also known as Cefuroxine. But amoxicillin is typically the go-to drug for outpatient treatment of bacterial pneumonia. If you're treating them inpatient, you'll give them IV medication. So that can be something like Cefotaxime or Ceftriaxone. Uh, so both of these drugs uh, cover the major culprits, particularly, uh, particularly strep pneumonia, uh, for uh, the bacterial causes. Uh, if the child developed the pneumonia while in the hospital, or if the chest x-ray shows cavitary lesions, uh, then you'll want to treat them for Staph aureus. So you'll add on vancomycin or clindamycin. Uh, and really, I mean, these are treatments for MRSA, right? Uh, the reason we want to treat for MRSA is if they're in the hospital, and that's usually where they're going to develop Staph aureus pneumonia, you want to treat for MRSA. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to treat for MRSA if they develop it outside the hospital. Uh, you can look at your, uh, you can look at the, uh, the the rates for MRSA in the general community. But anytime you develop something that looks like Staph aureus in the hospital, treat for MRSA. Uh, so these are add-ons. So you're still going to treat them with uh, cefotaxime or ceftriaxone. You'll just add on either vancomycin or clindamycin. For mycoplasma or chlamydia pneumonia, you're going to give uh, azithromycin or erythromycin. We tend towards azithromycin because there's less uh, adverse effects. Also, azithromycin is very nice. You can take one pill for five days and you're done. Uh, so that's called a Z-pack, I believe, they're these little purple pills. Uh, but uh, zithromycin is our treatment for mycoplasma, chlamydia, pneumonia. You can also use uh, respiratory fluoroquinolone. So some people don't tolerate uh, azithromycin or erythromycin very well. So in those cases, if they're allergic, um, and I think it's like 10%, there's like 10% uh, cross uh, allergenicity between the penicillins and the azithromycin. Uh, if they really just have not tolerated azithromycin in the past very well, you can give them one of the respiratory fluoroquinolones, which include levofloxacin, gadifloxacin, and